we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. More specifically, this is History is Here to Help. And today we're going to study uh, African American history in the high schools of America. Uh, how much does it matter? Mm. Various possibilities. Um, anyway, okay, so for this show, we have uh, Carl Ackerman uh, and Russell Motter. Carl is, um, what, what shall I say, um, a uh, social studies historian kind of person. Um, and Russell is, uh, I, you're, well, I'm going to let Carl introduce Russell uh, in a moment. Okay, so Carl, would you introduce Russell Motter so we can know what we're dealing with here? Yes, um, you know, Russell, Russell Motter is a distinguished historian who's done his graduate work on Jimmy Carter. Um, but among other things, he teaches at uh, the wonderful and one of the best schools in the, in, in the nation, Iolani School. And um, one of the subjects he teaches, which is the subject of our discussion today, um, is African-American history. And um, Russell is an expert in this area, has brought many speakers into Hawaii. I mean, this is really uncanny because it's kind of expensive to come here. Um, but uh, even I, as a historian of Russia, um, count on Russell to give me advice because he's such a thoughtful and well-versed historian. Wow, that was good. Uh, welcome to the show, Russell. It's nice to have you with us here. And it's nice to be able to talk about history. And it's nice to be able to talk about this subject because I. I think this is a subject we have to keep on talking about until it gets resolved. And it's not going to be resolved anytime soon, is it? No, it's not. You know, hi history always changes. Uh, you know, the past is not dead. It's uh, the present always raises new questions for us about the past. Um, so I suspect, you know, this will never be resolved. But um, I'm glad that the nation is having a conversation about these matters. And uh, that's the important thing, really. And for our students, it's important that they uh, start raising questions uh, about these issues and, and reaching some conclusions themselves. So um, what is the history? I mean, uh, what is the history of, of teaching um, African-American studies, if you will, uh, in the high schools of America. And um, because, uh, you know, the, the Civil War didn't leave us with a good legacy, I would say. And there were people who uh, wanted to fight it all over again and still do. And part of that battle is taking place in the schools of America. Um, so what about teaching African-American history? Um, uh, has it been, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, under obstacles of one kind or another? Well, Sure. I mean, you know, I, I agree with you that the Civil War um, has, in, so, in some respects, uh, failed to be resolved. Um, but, you know, the Civil War was, uh, an, was a time of real promise. The, the post-Civil War era was a, was a time of promise. And, um, you know, history is not, um, doesn't work along a timeline of, uh, uninterrupted progress. Sometimes we get uh, two steps forward and then one step backwards. And I, and I think that's the history of um, racism um, in this country. So I, I think that, you know, your question about the history of African-American history in this country, uh, if we look at the 1960s, um, I think that's really when the historical profession um, and also people who were interested in advancing this idea of African-American history began to prevail upon colleges to offer black studies um, options for students. And um, I think since then, there, there has been a really rich historiography on African-American history and African-American studies. Um, as far as African-American studies and history in the high schools, you know, the textbooks respond in um, the 1970s and the 1980s by including much more African-American history um, in those textbooks. But typically it's been compartmentalized. Um, so with with an African-American studies course, we're really looking at uh, a way to weave African-American history 
into American history in a much more consistent way. People don't disappear during the Great Depression, for instance, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that's the purpose of uh, African-American history in part is to ensure um, a, a, a perspective that goes throughout American history. African-American history is American history. Mm. Yeah, but you know, when you say that uh, it, it, we we kind of got conscious of that in the 1960s, you're also saying that between the time of the Civil War and the 1960s, we weren't really conscious of trying to teach um, Black history in, in the schools. Um, we turned our back on it. And, and, and then you mentioned the term racism, which I think, you know, is part of this whole discussion. Um, because uh, although there was a you know an enlightenment right after the Civil War and uh, you know uh, and the end of involuntary servitude, um, the the fact is there was still racism and it grew and it grew in the time of Woodrow Wilson and it grew in the twenties and we were back to some you know previous some period previous to the Civil War, so we have racism you know strung right through American history. And maybe we, we awakened a little bit in 1960s. But you know what? <clears throat> the thing to me, and I'm really asking about this, is if we teach Black history in the schools now or any time after 1960, we're really saying there is still racism. If there were no racism, Russell, would there still be a need to teach Black history in the schools? Oh, sure, because racism can't be separated from our past. And uh, that always needs to be studied. Um, so, you know, there it is. Um, you know, we, 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 don't, um, we don't have indentured servitude any longer, but we still need to study about indentured servitude in, you know, the early colonial period. So uh, the need for studying racism, uh, I think, is, is always going to be there. Hmm. Yeah, okay, I, have, I would have to um, agree with that. Now, we, we've seen uh, an upturn in racism, at least expressed racism in this country over the Trump years. Um, and maybe it was there before, but he, he, he expressed it. He caused it to be expressed. And part of that was this thing about critical race theory which seems to be, in my view, racist. Um, I mean, the, that is the controversy over it. Uh, we shouldn't have a critical race theory because we don't want to talk about race and we don't want to talk about racism. And, um, you know, that, that's not a happy thing, is it? Uh, where does that get in the way of teaching um, African-American history in the high schools? Well, that's a really good question. And, and you know, I think a, a lot of times when people talk about critical race theory, um, it, it, it's a kind of fuzzy concept, right? And, and as you probably know, critical race theory really emerged in uh, law schools. And, you know, it, it's- it, it's. A, I haven't been to law school since 1971. <laughs> and that was a, a master's program. So I, you, you can't you say that I know about law schools today. Okay. But, uh, you know, look, um, racism was- was built into the law. I mean, that's what Jim Crow was all about. And if we think that somehow we have um, escaped the legacy of Jim Crow, uh, I think we're fooling ourselves. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the the whole critical race theory discussion um, has a has a bit of a red herring. Uh, quality to it. It distracts us from what we really need to be uh, talking about. And, you know, in my classes, you know, I do talk about fair housing issues, redlining, that sort of thing. And and those are the issues that I think have been um, d discussed within that critical race theory um, idea. And uh, so we owe something to the scholars who have opened up those questions for sure. We need to know what we're talking about here. Precision is really important, I think, you know, when we talk about these matters. 
Well, it, it seems to me that uh, everybody ought to be exposed to this conversation because that's the way you deal with racism. You, you learn. You learn what has happened historically, the problems that have arisen historically, um, and then and then you you find solutions uh, in studying history. That's why we we say history is here to help. Um, history reveals the problems, but then the discussion conceivably, hopefully, reveals the solution. So when you have these classes about African American history, I guess everybody attends is is an elective. Um, uh, what 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 do the non black students get out of it? They walk out of your courses uh, with a new view of the world. Uh, yeah, so th this is a good question. I mean, who takes the course? Um, you know, I, Jay, I, I got to tell you that in in my career, I've I've been teaching twenty seven years at Iolani School, and I've never seen a group of students who have been so interested and so politically aware as this group of students. You know, probably since uh, the 2016 election. So students of all different backgrounds are interested in these matters, and they're interested in them from the, you know, from the standpoint of of wanting to change the world around them. Um, but they also want to find out who they are. Um, you know, African American studies is a way to help answer the question: What does it mean to be an American? not just what does it mean to be an African-American. These students want to find out who they are. So, I mean, that's one of the, one of what was one of the most pleasant kind of um, discoveries that I made when I first offered this course 20 some odd years ago. Are you teaching other courses in history of the Alliance? I guess you are. What other courses do you focus on? Sure, I teach AP US history. Um, I also his, teach a history of American popular song, um, and I teach a course called History of the Sixties as well. They didn't. They didn't have those those courses in my <laughs> high school. <laughs> I, I, I'm really lucky to be able to teach in an environment where where you know our our head of school says, "Hey, we want you to teach the things that you're interested in," and and to be able to do that is, is just great. It's not even like a job. How about your academic career? What's your focus on there? Yeah, so um, I I, um, I graduated uh, from the University of Hawaii um, and a degree in history. Um, I I did my uh, master's thesis on Jimmy Carter, as as Carl mentioned. So I was always kind of a history of the American South kind of a person. Um, but I was also interested in presidential history. Um, as an undergraduate, I took a lot of Russian history classes too, so I was interested in American foreign policy there. Um, I went to Rice uh, with the idea of um, doing more work on Jimmy Carter, and then I also went to Columbia to study at the Institute for Research in African American Studies. So, um, you know, th those are my academic interests, really. Mm, that's great. What a great background. Ilani's lucky. So, Carl. Thank you. <laughs> Carl, um, you know, just uh, what you were uh, teaching social studies, including history at Punahou. Um, that's the other school. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what, you know, what, did you have this similar experience here? Uh, what were you focusing on when you taught those subjects? Well, you know, Jay, um, uh, Russell and I and uh, another wonderful man by the name of Josh Rapoon, and I'm, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the Rapoon family here in Hawaii. Uh, very prominent family and tarot farmers uh, to boot. Um, but we taught a European history class one summer. And, um, you know, a guy um, uh, who was often in the news came in on the bequest of, of Russell Motter, um, a guy named Timothy, Timothy Niftali, I'm sorry, the Niftali, name Russell. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who, you know, it's all over the news and CNN and, you know, took over, I think, the uh, Nixon um, Nixon um, Museum. Am I right there, Russell? Presidential Library, right. He yeah. was... So, 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 you know, um, uh, it was a glorious class. And, you know, you can approach history in a variety of ways. Currently at Punahou, and I can't speak for Punahou because, as you know, Jay, I retired there two years ago, but and I'm now just an independent historian and author. But um, what's nice about Punahou is that they subject um, history courses with a different angle. For example, I taught European history through Russian eyes, and one of my colleagues taught uh, European history through art. But just to make a comment, and, and by the way, they, we, 
Punahou, at least at the time of my leaving, did not have this class, which I think should be um, a, uh, um, a course at every high school in America. And by the way, Jay, uh, the college board is preparing um, a um, advanced placement African-American history class. And let me say two things about that. Then I want to get back to Russell because he's a real expert. One is that they're um, testing this out. Uh, at different um, uh, high schools throughout the country. And I'll let, um, I don't want to steal Russell's thunder here. I'll talk about that. Um, and the second thing is, you know, just from, you know, um, a lay historian, and I'm not a specialist on U.S. history the way Russell is, but I would say that the African-American experience starts in the, in the pre-revolutionary period and works its way all the way up to uh, the contemporary period. And how could you not have an, uh, an African-American history class when, when the Civil War is so central um, to our um, history as a country, I mean, what was that about, really? You know, I mean, what was the, what was the, what was the controversy, right? And so, um, you know, I just think that it's absolutely wonderful that this is, is coming about. And I, I, would, I would not do due diligence to my friend um, Russell Motter by saying, I've sat in and has class on, on several occasions, which includes art and literature. And as I mentioned before, many guest speakers and how he convinces these people <laughs> to come from the mainland. And one of them, Jay, just as an aside, because we live in Hawaii, he takes them out of the boat to go fishing and the guy catches a swordfish, you know, so that guy wants to come back to Hawaii. So in any case, Russell's class is really um, quite marvelous. And I hope that Punahou follows Russell Motter's um, and the wonderful example at Iolani School. And we, we've we been friends for a long time. And there's not an ounce of schoolism in any of us because, you know, um, if there was an ounce of schoolism in, in me, I, you know, I would never talk to my Stanford-educated niece. And I, I just don't believe in such things. But anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Russell. To let him talk about the college. Board. So, Russell, we want, to, we want to go to your class here. Call it a case study. <laughs> and uh, we want to start at uh, whenever you start, whether it's 1600 or thereafter. And uh, we want to finish where you finish, uh, which could be right now. It could be, you know, uh, perspectives, perspectives into the future. Uh, so where do you start? Where do you end? What, what is the sweep of your discussion of African-American history? Well, um, as, as Carl mentioned, Jay, you know, the course is, a, is designed as an interdisciplinary course. So we're looking at history, we're looking at literature, we're looking at art, we're looking at music, we're looking at dance. So, and, and this is what the College Board has in mind with AP African American Studies as well. You know, and interdisciplinary um, is valuable because it, it it's able to draw students in um, who, who might not be interested in history, for instance, but they might be interested in art or they might be interested in music. So there's a little something there um, I think for everyone, um, you know, I, I open the course, uh, by talking about, um, race and, and what my mentor and friend, Barbara Fields at Columbia university calls the ideology of race. Um, and the idea is that race is not based on any kind of scientific fact, um, that, that race is really a fiction. And it was a fiction that was necessary um, when the Americans and their revolution said that all men are created equal. Uh, what they were saying there with that idea is that we're gonna organize our society in a different kind of way. Um, your status in society is not going to be determined by who your father was. As, as was the case in virtually every other place in the world at that time. This was something, this was something new. And um, standing in the way of that proposition, of course, was slavery. Um, and it, it, it's a very convenient thing to have uh, an idea called race that allows you to say all men are created equal, um, but also maintain that institution of slavery. And so well, I start to create an equal, except that some men are created more equal than others. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I, and, 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 you know, people look, ideologies don't have to be true. They just have to make sense. <laughs> so if, if you have a bunch of uh, slaveholders who want to maintain 
those slaves maintain that property, um, this is the way that it was achieved. It was able to reconcile that fundamental contradiction. And um, so, it, you know, race is an idea that unfortunately, Fortunately, Americans have become all too attached to, and so this is the first thing that I do in the courses, is, you know, talk about that idea and get students to think a little bit differently um, about that idea. And, and of course, you know, we, we do hit the, the colonial period and the Revolutionary War period, and, and we go through American history as, as perhaps we would in a conventional class. Um, but along the way, you know, we're reading Frederick Douglass. Uh, I was we're... just going to ask you about him. Uh, sure. Abolitionism, it seems to me, would be a really important part of this course because that, too, has not been resolved. A absolutely. I mean, um, you know, Frederick Douglass um, was the most famous American orator of the 1850s and 60s. He was the most photographed American of the post civil war period i would say and perhaps even you know before so students need to know about him they need to know about booker t washington and 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 w e b du bois um they need to know more about the harlem renaissance and and um musicians like louis armstrong and duke ellington um, they need to know about Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm ran for president in 1972, the first woman what to run for president. Course. I want to come and audit your class. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you come in anytime, anytime. <laughs> and what about civil rights? What about Martin Luther King? I mean, that's uh, it's just not exactly, you know, current history, but it's very important and to follow on the abolition, ab abolitionist movement. Uh, and Frederick Douglass and all that, it's, it's a similar kind of analysis um, where civil rights all of a sudden through Lyndon Johnson becomes codified. That's an extraordinary event. Um, and, and query, you know, what, how do you treat that in terms of an event that was, that was related to earlier things like Frederick Douglass and later things like all that happened under the Trump administration? Well, you know, Jay, for historians, context is everything. And sometimes we forget about that when we take a look at figures like Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you know, we think about Martin Luther King right now as this kind of this warm, fuzzy person, kind of a kumbaya kind of fella. But, you know, King was a radical. He was a radical in the tradition that Frederick Douglass was a radical. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. helped uh, reshape and revolutionize Southern society. Um, so, uh, you know, by, by challenging Jim Crow and, and ultimately uh, making Jim Crow illegal, uh, you mentioned the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which restored voting rights for, for black people. And th this, you know, this was a fundamental change. It was also a fundamental fear uh, of, you know, for a lot of white people, especially in the South during this period of time. So, you know, um, I, I think taking a hard look at Martin Luther King Jr., of, of taking a good look at, at Malcolm X as well, um, and providing a context, you know, for how those men acted in that particular moment um, is important for students to, to in, if they're going to reach any conclusions about that legacy. You know, um, it's um, not everybody agrees with that. Um, there are people who don't want to see this taught in the high schools. Uh, they don't want to hear about it. Um, they, they don't want the African-Americans to, quote, replace us. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, it seems to me that uh, your course ought to include that in terms of the, you know, the kind of uh, let's attack the school board. Let's, uh, let's take books out of the library. Uh, let's make sure we don't cover the subject uh, at all in our uh, course offerings. Uh, what uh, is on the minds of those who would uh, oppose education that way? Uh, let me ask you first, Carl. What is on the minds of those, those who would oppose education? Uh, and it's, it's in many places, many states, many communities. There are um, uneducated people 
uh, trying to force their way into the classroom. Well, Jay, <clears throat> what makes this course so appealing, even for some of those folk, let me answer it this way, is because um, uh, it's, an, it's gonna be an advanced placement class. And uh, Russell's so modest that he's not mentioning this, but Elani has been picked to be one of the sample schools. They don't just offer AP courses, they test it and do all the statistical information. And, and so, um, and there's a man, by the way, responsible for the AP courses, and he's quite remarkable, and he should be mentioned here, Trevor Packer. Um, and he's quite remarkable and big on this um, new course um, opening up. But, you know, I mean, this particular course, um, I, I think that people sometimes are against um, certain types of history because it doesn't agree with their ideology. And um, that's, the, that's the bottom line. And they, if for some reason, they feel threatened uh, for, for, for one reason or, uh, or another. And this allusion to critical race theory is just the most obnoxious thing that I've ever seen come out of the sort of um, right because it's, it's, it's not based on anything. There's no critical race theory being taught in, on a K through 12 level. That's just, a, that's just a terribly ignorant. Now, what the right is correct about is this notion of the left um, at universities going way over and just, you know, being so sensitive to everything and that, you know, a normal uh, um, discourse can take place. And uh, uh, um, Jay and Russell, if, if, if I ever use those pronouns that people are attaching to their names, I want you to take me out and shoot me because uh, that's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. In, and it's being used now in, you know, across America. And I'll leave you with this, uh, Jay and Russell. I want Russell and Jay, to, you guys to have a last word, but Shirley Chisholm um, wrote a book and it was called Unbought and Unbossed, which was one of my favorite books. Like I think I read it in high school. And um, and I think it describes the three men on this panel. Jay, Jay let, let me just jump in and, and dovetail a little bit on what Carl just said. And, you know, unfortunately, I, I think in our national life today, we, we live in a time where Everybody thinks they know a lot about everything. And um, that's true on the right. I think it's true on the left as well. And what I what I really want students to do, whether they're in my African-American studies class or my AP U.S. history class, is come into class with a little bit of humility. And, and, and uh, you know, if, if, if you think you know something about something, check that at the door. And um, proceed uh, with an open mind, and um, and and check back when when you've actually done a little bit of listening and um, done a little bit of reading, and and most of all some thinking. Um, and and so you know th that's what's so kind of distressing, I think, about uh, our conversation today and it's, it, it, because people have made up their minds about things about which they might not know a whole lot. And um, I, I think a little bit of humility would go a long way in, in solving that, that particular problem. Uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you a question about um, how we should deal with those who don't want to teach whatever it means, ra uh, you know, critical race theory, or for that matter, African-American history. Uh, in in high school or or otherwise in colleges in the United States, <clears throat> uh, what and and of course the ones who want to take the books out of the library and otherwise appear and vociferously attempt to change the curriculum at school board meetings. Um, what do you say to them? If you were there, let's say at a school board meeting, when this came up, what would you say to them uh, in terms of? Uh, I know, trying to find a resolution, and I'm not. I'm not saying they're right in any way. Um, but for example, uh, if you don't agree with the way I, ca I as the teacher, cast the history, uh, African American history, in the United States, uh, why don't you tell me how you think I should cast it? Uh, why don't you know? Why don't Why don't we hear your side of the story? Um, or, uh, or why don't you just leave the room because we don't need to hear. The kind of rhetoric you're delivering to a school board. What what, what do you say to them? Um, you you know, Jay, it, it's funny. You know, sometimes people who who don't want to confront the ugly parts of our past, uh, they do want to preserve 
the stuff that they think is good. Um, and, and I'm all for that too. I mean, I'm, I mean, I think that building a society and a government along the principle that all men are created equal is a great thing. And it's something that we ought to be proud of. Um, but, you know, the question is, who is going to decide what gets preserved and what gets thrown out? Um, you know, you, you sometimes hear white Southerners talking about preserving their heritage. Well, you know, I know a lot of black Southerners. <laughs> and so, you know, it, when you're talking about Southern heritage, what are we really talking about when in a place like Mississippi or South Carolina, where where right now 35 or 40 percent of the population is black? I mean, I think just asking those kinds of obvious questions um, might go away toward um, bridging that gap that exists between people who are afraid of the unpleasant parts of our past um, and and those who, who who might want us to confront it. You know, back back in the day, um, in my in my life anyway, uh, it was it was a surprise to find um, a, a marriage between a black and a white, but it happened. And then you looked again, and it happened more and more. And in Hawaii, which has been a leader in that sort of thing, I mean, everybody marries everybody, right? Uh, which is a wonderful thing that we all learn and we relish. Uh, and we try to export, you know, that kind of view. Um, short story: I went to the, I went back one time to the Museum of Natural History and waited on line for the Hayden Planetarium. And I looked at the line. My wife wasn't with me. I looked at the line, and I noticed that all the couples on the line were mixed. All the children on the line were mixed. Maybe this was a certain strata of educated people who were on the line to go to the Hayden Planetarium. But it struck me that New York is very diverse now and very mixed. <clears throat> and so uh, my question to you is, over time, um, doesn't black and white marriage intermingling, if you will, have an effect on the, on the phenomena that you just described in the South? I, look, Jay, if there's one thing we know about Hawaii is that we're all invested in each other. And, you know, Part of it does have to do with people intermingling, right? And, you know, the thing is, is people have done this for a long, long time. Uh, one of my favorite film clips uh, from the Selma March is, of course, King at the front of the line, along with several other leaders wearing lei. And, you know, um, I, I had a conversation once with Dickie Wong, who, um, you know, the, the, the great... Uh, disruptor of Hawaii politics. Dickey was a um, what was a union leader at that time. And, and, you know, he decided that he absolutely had to be at Selma. So one of his friends who was a, a Teamster truck driver, they, they got on a plane, went to Alabama. So um, they were there. Hawaii was there. And there's this great sign that the people from Hawaii brought to that Selma march. And the sign said, Hawaii knows integration works. And that was 1965. And you know, it wasn't until 1967 in Loving versus the state of Virginia that the Supreme Court ruled that, uh, that, that, that laws that prevented people from marrying each other based on so-called race was unconstitutional. And, you know, for kids in Hawaii and, and for people in Hawaii to, to kind of confront that fact is astonishing that in 1967, it was illegal in some places in this country for people who loved each other to marry each other. So, um, I, I mean, I, I know that that was a little bit of a divergent from from your question, but, um, you know, that those are the surprises, I think, that that history confronts us with. Um, and, and, you know, today, young people, um, certainly those young people that I teach in Hawaii, the, the idea of people marrying one another, um, you know, a, a, across the color line or same sex marriage, those things are taken for granted by our young people today. And, um, you know, when they, when I'm hopeful that when they get in charge, 
uh, that maybe these won't be issues any longer. Mm, from your lips to God's ears, because um, I think it's deeply ingrained uh, in American society, and it isn't going to go away anytime soon in states which in states which now run the House of Representatives, those states. <laughs> And I, you know, you can talk about educating people, but um, any change in education, any change in the way school boards work takes years and years. So, yes, what you're doing in, in certain states would be very effective and uh, important. But in other states, it's hard to get to the front door. Um, how do you get to the front door? Do you need legislation? You need some sort of national action, not to say that it's available right now, it is not available right now, um, but at some point, um, do we need legislation or action? Do we need a court decision from the Supreme Court? It would not be available right now, but maybe later um, to say that this will be taught. Um, boy, that, 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 again, it's a good question. I'm not a politician, I'm a teacher, um, but it is distressing that my colleagues on the mainland um, are you know, they're they're facing a lot of trouble. There's a lot of trouble out there for teachers nowadays um, in the classroom. It seems like there's always somebody watching and somebody willing to complain. And, you know, again, it's 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 not just from the right, but it, it it's from the left as well. Um, you know, Jay, I mean, it, it seems to me that um, this this moment that we're in where school where, where boards of education have been captured by people who are hostile to education. Um, that happened quite suddenly, I think, you know. So I'm 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 hopeful that perhaps um the loosening of the grip might happen just as swiftly. I don't have an answer uh, about how that could happen. You know, parents' voices are are really important. They're important in our school, they're important in independent schools for sure. Um, but I think that parents have got to step forward and and you know say their piece when they think that something is wrong. Isn't that the truth? You know, I it's another show, another discussion, but um, you know, parents should be invested as I thought they were years ago in schools. <clears throat> Not just um, you know, do the latchkey thing and leave the kid and the teacher to work it out. <clears throat> they should know what their kid is studying. They should know how well their kid is doing. They should talk to their kid at the dinner table. Leave it to Beaver and find out what, how the kid spent his time and, and what it was all about. Um, one other question comes to mind about this is, is, you know, we talked about it. We fashioned the title of the show as African-American history in high school. But, um, you know, just listening to you, it seems to me and it, it need not be limited to high school. Um, what other grades, what what lower grades uh, should be involved? Um, you know, I, I think that um, that lower school, grammar school teachers are aware of these issues. At Iolani School, we're, we're certainly aware of them, too. And, you know, Jay, I remember, you know, going to the library as a kid and, and um borrowing books as a nine, 10 year old and, and reading about Jackie Robinson and Thurgood Marshall and, and John F. Kennedy, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I, you know, kids are, kids have questions, you know, and, and we ought to present material to them that raises questions for them. Right. And I mean, that's the whole point isn't it, is for an education to help people answer questions that they have. Um, you know, I, I, I do want to say one thing, though, about, um, Jay, as, as you were talking, you know, I, I thought about the about what people think about teachers in this country. And um, I'm, I'm afraid that we're at a point where teachers don't get the respect that perhaps they deserve. And certainly public school teachers don't get the respect that they deserve. They're professional people. Yeah, I mean, maybe there might be a few teachers out there who are bad teachers, just like there are bad doctors and bad bad lawyers. But as a class, as a group, you know, teachers ought to be listened to because they're the pros. And 
part of the problem when school boards get taken over by those who know best is they tend to close their ears to what teachers have to say. Oh, I think that's such an important point and consideration. Uh, we've seen a number of articles about that, about how teachers are leaving the field. Uh, they're not being paid enough, but that's only part of the problem. Oh, they're I think so too. Treated with respect, and uh, they're not their their credentials, their training is not being respected, and uh, they're being told what to teach, what not to teach. Uh, they're given a, a a primer on everything they can say and not say in the classroom by people who don't know better. Um, this is a you know, may I use the term crisis? It's a crisis that we're losing our teachers. It's a crisis that they are losing their, what do you call it, academic freedom. Um, and uh, and thus our kids are, are the victims. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. You know, I was really lucky to teach at Iolani School where we weathered the pandemic really well. We were very lucky. We had great leadership at our school and, um, and being in Hawaii too, what was a was a blessing during the pandemic. My colleagues on the mainland, you know, I'm I'm, I'm especially in the public schools. I'm afraid uh, that was a that was that was a bad period, and, and and it was rough. It was rough on teachers, and it was rough on students, and it was rough on parents as well. And and we need teachers, as you say. And 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 I agree with you that it's not just about the money. Money is important for sure, um, but it but it is about respect, um, and. You know, there are we're in a, we're in a labor market right now where people have choices and, you know, it's distressing to see good teachers leaving the profession because they just don't want to deal, you know, with the kind of um, atmosphere that 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 I think has popped up and, you know, in the last three or four years. Yeah, well, I think it needs immediate attention. You know, we have a variety of, uh, of talk shows that deal with what's happening in Congress and and the White House and the Supreme Court that's on a regular basis every week. And invariably, on every one of those shows, one of our speakers, uh, sometimes we have two, three, four people contributing, um, on, invariably on every one of those shows, somebody says, this is all a matter of education. We would have better citizens, and they in turn could vote better, and they could you know, um, make better decisions on you know, citizen input, voter input into how the government works. Bottom line, though, is changing education um, to provide uh, those concepts and to improve the classroom experience is not an overnight affair. Um, and arguably, it takes decades to do that. If you, you start from, you know, organizing the Department of Education in a different way and, and um, you know, setting up more freedom for teachers and so forth, so it's not as if you could, you know, make a magic wand on this and um, and and teach better citizens. Um, how do you do that? You know, part of this whole discussion of teaching African-American history in the classrooms of the high schools and maybe the junior high schools <clears throat> is to make better citizens. <laughs> That's what it's about, really. And how do you how do you do that on a national basis? Uh, you you know, Jay, I think, you know, one of the things that that I try to do as a teacher and I'm committed to is I, I'm not there to tell students what to think. I'm there to teach them how to think. And, I, you know, I think the profession would do itself a favor by constantly reminding its critics um, who have captured school boards that that's really what we're doing in the schools. So when I'm teaching my African American studies class, um, I'm not teaching them what to think. I'm te teaching them how to think. Um, they won't remember the facts and the, you know, the 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 little pieces of the course once they leave, but they'll remember how to think. And you know, I think that's what that's what we do as as, as teachers. One last question is this, and I guess it, it, it runs through our entire discussion, is that you, you want to talk about African-American history and thus African-American issues, and especially African-American issues today. It's been politicized, okay? And, and, and even in a liberal school, you can make a comment as a teacher that will be seen as politicized. 
uh, <clears throat> you could you could run down white supremacists and find white supremacists parading outside the school. Uh, you could you know you could uh, talk about Black Lives Matter to somebody who thinks Black Lives Matter should exclude all the Jews, for example, and then you find people parading outside your school. So you are always walking a fine line of uh, being charged with politicizing an historical and um, you know civic-minded subject where it's an open discussion, you want to help people learn to think and so forth, but you always run the risk of being uh, charged with politicization. Is this a problem? I, look, I, I have to say that for me in at Iolani, th this is not a problem, but I understand you know what you're saying here, and it does present problems for my colleagues on the mainland for sure. Um, you know, look, I, I agree with you that we're in a highly charged political atmosphere now when it comes to education, but education has always been politicized. I mean, if, if, if we think about the Jim, Jim Crow era, uh, with black schools and white schools, I can't, I can't think of a more, uh, politicization of, of education than separating students along the color line. You know, so we've we've always dealt with this. Um, I, I think that what we need to remember is that there are when we're when we're talking about American history and when we're talking about African American history, when we talk about racism and and anti-Semitism um, in our classes, it's there. It's in the history that there are. That's a principle that's that's violated when people go down that road of hate and um you know that's that's just that's just not up for discussion in in my classroom right or and it shouldn't be in any classroom and you know it's it's in a lot of ways it's against the law in this country to i mean you can express those opinions if you want to but when you act in a way that uh, violates someone's civil rights, uh, you're going to be violating the law. So, um, you know, I, I, I just, you know, it, it's distressing that we're polarized. We're going to get through this. Um, I think that the discussion that we're having now, as uh, contentious as it is, um, I, I think that we're at a, a a a point on the the pendulum has swung in an extreme position it will swing back um we're going to have new problems down the road for sure uh but i think people of goodwill um and and you know can 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 prevail you know i'm optimistic about that i mean my frederick douglas was optimistic Du Bois was optimi optimistic. King was optimistic. So that's where my hope is. Good for you, Russell. Good that you're doing it. It's a, Thank you. Know, you. It's a great contribution, not only to the school and the state, but the country. Um, we all ought to be talking about this and like this. And I really appreciate your participation in it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Appreciate it. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.